tonight. Fatal flight. Four killed in a plane crash near North Stradbroke Island. Going national, fire work bans spread across the country as the dispute worsens. And back on top, the new Art Centre spire takes its place on Melbourne's skyline. Good evening, Sue McIntosh in Melbourne with ABC News. Hopes of a resolution to the Victorian firefighters' pay dispute were destroyed late this afternoon. The Metropolitan Fire Brigade took legal action, serving writs on 16 members of the union for alleged illegal use of fire trucks. It's the second time the MFB has taken steps to sue members of the union, which earlier today claimed the dispute was close to resolution. This is what's angered the Metropolitan Fire Brigade. It claims the union is using emergency vehicles as mobile billboards to advertise its pay claim. Late this afternoon, the brigade took legal action against the union, seeking damages for conversion of MFB property. The writ also claims that the union has induced employees to create a nuisance to MFB property and that it's unlawfully interfered with the conduct of MFB operations and business activities. Less than an hour before the writ was served, the union was confident the dispute was close to resolution. We hope that sufficient goodwill has been expressed by us and uh, certainly we are somewhat buoyed by uh, Mr Kennett's uh, somewhat conciliatory remarks yesterday and uh, we're hopeful that's sufficient to uh, bring about enough goodwill to settle this dispute. A national executive meeting had drawn up a proposal offering efficiency and productivity trade-offs for a 10% pay rise. The MFB welcomed the proposal. We're absolutely delighted if they give us a proposal that's realistic and uh, we will jump at the chance to end this dispute. All states had voted at today's national executive meeting to reimpose administrative bans around the country starting this weekend. But the union says this afternoon's legal action has destroyed any hope of an early resolution. Four people have been killed in a light plane crash near Brisbane this afternoon. One was an 11-year-old boy celebrating his birthday. The plane flipped and burst into flames. All on board perished. The pilot had just taken off from a grass airstrip on North Stradbroke Island, 50 kilometres east of Brisbane. Today's flight was to be a birthday present, a joy flight for an 11-year-old boy and two friends. But as the single-engine Wilga aircraft took off from North Stradbroke Island, it flipped over and erupted into flames. All three passengers and the pilot were killed. Witnesses rushed to help, but there was little they could do. I understand there were two witnesses at the time and um, both witnesses attended with fire extinguishers and uh, tried to put out the fire. Among the horrified onlookers, family of the passengers. One of the boy's fathers tried to rescue his son and received severe burns in the process. He's been taken to Dunwich Hospital for treatment. The plane was completely destroyed on impact. Well, obviously the scene's pretty devastating. I mean, looking at the, the aircraft and the, the, the wreckage, um, it seems very hard to imagine that anyone could have walked away from that at all. Police don't know why the plane suddenly flipped. They say the Brisbane-based pilot in his late 40s was experienced. The Polish-built plane was based on North Stradbroke Island for the holiday season and had made other joy flights during the school break. Air safety officials are still investigating the crash. The families of the victims are undergoing counselling. The battle over industrial relations policy has been joined by Minister Laurie Brereton. He's attacked the coalition's new industrial relations policy as a sham. And the trade policy debate has begun. The coalition criticising the government for not taking on countries which put up barriers against our exports. Political editor Russell Barton. There may be no election date yet, but the policy debates are up and running. John Howard stole a march on Monday, catching the government unprepared for his launch of the industrial relations policy. But today, Laurie Brereton emerged from holidays, blazing away. The powers of the industrial, of the employment advocate, are no powers at all. It's not going to be a judicial body, and it's not going to have any powers whatsoever to order back payment of any wages in dispute. The Coalition's Peter Reith says no one ever claimed the proposed employment advocate could order employers to provide back pay. It's not a judicial body, we never said it was. Uh, ridiculous to suggest that it would be. That's a function to be carried out by the courts. The courts of common law in Australia have a delay of one, two and three years at the moment. That's why we've got an Industrial Relations Commission. 
to give speedy justice. The Industrial Relations Commission can't chase up unpaid monies. That's a job for the arbitration inspectorate today under Labor's position. Mr Brereton is keen to refute any suggestions that there's little difference between the parties on industrial relations. The gulf between us is as great as ever. Their policies to ours are political chalk to political cheese. And accentuating the differences where there are few is also the coalition's approach on trade. Tim Fisher's policy launch today lashing the government for not putting enough emphasis on bilateral problems with individual countries. We don't even have from the Minister for Trade of the Australian Government, all seven of them, since 1983, the courage to name publicly those countries which are giving Australia the raw end. Strategy putting too much emphasis on bilateralism is found is doomed to failure. Mr Fisher did reveal a coalition government would appoint an ambassador to APEC and former prime ministers could be in the running. So I've always uh, believed that uh, people like uh, Malcolm Fraser has had a... Uh, diplomatic role to play. Bob Hawke was also mentioned, but Mr Fisher said Paul Keating need not apply. The Attorney General has overhauled Australia's family law system, hoping to make it more simple, accessible and less costly. The reforms were announced in Brisbane's Federal Court today. Outside, anti-family law demonstrators protested against the jailing of a father who breached a court access order. More than 40% of Australian marriages end in divorce. Now the federal government is working to make the parting and resulting problems like custody and property settlements as painless as possible. After three years reviewing the system, authorities hope a two-part reform package will speed up the legal process. The purpose of it is to make family law simpler, to make it more available and to make it less expensive to the community. And if we succeed in that, we'll have achieved a, a, a considerable amount. The federal government has spent $160 million on its justice reforms. Family law should primarily be about people, about solving people's problems, about working with people in terms of probably the most traumatic part or period of their lives. The reform package includes easier application and response forms, processes to encourage solving disputes by agreement rather than hearing, procedures tailored to suitcases which don't proceed to judgment and a six-week wait until the first court date rather than the current nine weeks. The Attorney-General will release a second part of the law reform package later this month. It will aim to reduce the number of family court cases by increasing support networks and counselling services. In what's believed to be a legal first in Australia, a Perth man has been charged with manslaughter after his four dogs were found to be responsible for the death of an 85-year-old woman. Perina Chocolich died after being attacked by a pack of dogs which had bitten her more than 80 times. 32-year-old Giovanni Pacino has already been convicted of failing to prevent his three Rottweilers and a German Shepherd Cross from killing the woman last June. Mr Pacino has lodged an appeal against that conviction and against an order that his dogs be destroyed. He was remanded on bail of $50,000 to appear again in a fortnight. If found guilty of the charge, Pacino faces a maximum of 20 years imprisonment. The Victorian Police Force has rejected a study that blames red light cameras for a dramatic increase in rear end collisions. But police say the cameras have also reduced more serious impacts. More from police reporter Lara Carey. Many motorists would be happy to see the last of red light cameras. And according to a report by the Australian Road Research Board, they're responsible for a significant increase in the number of rear end collisions. We're not prepared or even reconsidering removing the red light cameras from our road safety uh, program uh, in Victoria at the moment. The study analysed accidents at 41 intersections between 1979 and 1989. While it shows a 10% increase in the number of rear-end collisions at red light camera intersections, there's been a 30% reduction in the more dangerous high-impact crashes. Every month, 1,200 motorists are detected running a red light. A practice police say was responsible for the deaths of seven people on Victoria's roads last year. The study also questioned why red light cameras were placed at low frequency accident sites. Uh, we would support further evaluation and if that evaluation shows that the red light cameras are perhaps at the wrong intersections, we would support their removal to areas where uh, high crash records are predominant. 
But police say the accidents may be caused by signs warning of camera use near the intersection and are considering removing them. Two other studies have been commissioned to provide more information. Hopes are fading for a bloodless end to the hostage crisis being played out between Russian forces and Chechen guerrillas. Russia has tightened the noose, throwing a ring of tanks around the village where the rebels hold 160 captives. The Chechen commanders at Pervomaskaya, on the border of Chechnya and Dagestan, threatened to fight to the last bullet. The Russian army has been thrown into full-scale war preparations by just 200 Chechen gunmen. All day the build-up has gone on. Helicopters, tanks, guns and trucks. Hundreds of soldiers blockade all roads into the little village of Pervomaiskaya. It's been deserted by its inhabitants and is totally under the control of the gunmen. The hostages have been allowed to leave the buses and to make themselves at home in the empty houses. They include doctors from the hospital where the drama first began. All are terrified that the Russians might try to punish the terrorists with an all-out assault on the village. If you look at the hardware around here, things could go either way. But the main thing is to free the hostages. Quite honestly, I don't see any prospect for negotiations. Talks have been going on, but to little avail. At this meeting on the road outside the village, there was no meeting of minds. We came here to release the hostages and get guarantees for our safe passage, says this Chechen fighter. But instead, the Russians are talking about something quite different. At exactly 3 p.m., as if to some precise plan, dozens of army vehicles suddenly moved in closer to the village, covered by assault helicopters overhead. It looked like preparations for an assault. It could be plain intimidation. Still looking for a peaceful way out, President Yeltsin today mooted the possibility of withdrawing his troops from Chechnya if the Chechens renounce force. He's promised that before, and it's unlikely to persuade the gunmen in Pervomaiske to surrender. President Clinton has conceded he may leave the White House broke because of legal bills. The frank admission came at a Washington news conference, the first time the president has faced the general media for five months. He was asked about a magazine article claiming legal costs involving the Whitewater affair and a sexual harassment suit amounted to nearly two million dollars a year. I didn't run for this office for the money and I've, I feel badly that uh, that 20 years of our hard effort and savings may go away. But if I stay healthy, uh, I'll be able to pay my bills and earn a pretty good living. I'm Another step towards peace in the Middle East with the release of 200 Palestinian prisoners from Israeli jails. Greeted by relatives, the men are among the last few thousand prisoners who will be released by May under the peace pact. But many militant Muslims avoided the celebrations. Instead, they attended a West Bank ceremony in memory of assassinated terrorist Yahya Ayesh, known as the engineer for his bomb-making skills. Booster ignition and liftoff of Endeavour in pursuit of... And the space shuttle Endeavour has roared into space on a nine-day mission that includes the rescue of a Japanese satellite. The liftoff went ahead after temperatures crept above the near freezing levels NASA believes caused the Challenger explosion in 1986. Family and friends of former French President Francois Mitterrand attended a simple burial in his hometown as world leaders paid tribute at a memorial mass in Paris. The twin ceremonies were the final farewell to the former French president who died on Monday at the age of 79. Flags flew at half-mast as the nation observed a day of public mourning. European correspondent Chris Clark. Two ceremonies for two sides of a complex politician. Sixty heads of state and government from around the world attended a requiem in Notre Dame Cathedral for a man who spent 50 years in French politics. Chancellor Helmut Kohl of Germany counted Francois Mitterrand as a personal friend as well as his key ally in European affairs. Outside the cathedral, some of those who'd helped propel him to two presidential terms gathered to watch the service and reflect on life without him. It was a grand farewell for a man who dedicated his life to politics. But while Mr Mitterrand will be remembered for his political achievements, he asked to be buried in the more humble surroundings of his birthplace. On board the military transport which bore the coffin to southwest France, 
was Mr. Mitterrand's black Labrador, Baltic, who he once referred to as his most faithful companion. And then to the small town of Jarnac, where he was born. Mr. Mitterrand had asked his wife, Danielle, to lead the mourners, but insisted that his longtime mistress, Anne Pinjot, and their daughter be there as well. The first time the two have been seen publicly with the rest of the Mitterrand family. Francois Mitterrand left Jarnac many years ago, but he always said this was where he felt most comfortable. A preference seemingly at odds with his liking for the grand gesture and entirely in keeping with his contradictory character. At home, a star-studded congregation turned out in Sydney today to mourn the actor John Hargraves. Friends, including Sam Neill, Brian Brown and Chris Haywood, attended a memorial mass to tell of their love for a brave and brilliant man. A who's who of film, theatre and television came from as far as New York to celebrate John Hargrave's life, cut short at just 50. As family actors, directors and fans gathered for the Requiem Mass, it was standing room only. Wouldn't John love this? <laughs> at his request, symbols of John Hargrave's life were laid on his casket. An address book recalling his friends from near and far, rosary beads signifying his family's prayers, and the trophy he won at the International Festival of Horror and Fantasy Films. Actor Sam Neill recounted John Hargrave's sense of humour. Whenever he saw me, he would put his arms around me in this big hug, and uh, this was excruciating, he would kiss me. <laughs> He knew that I was straight and I was from New Zealand and... <laughs> I remember so well. The tall, lanky blonde appeared in the back doorway with the sunlight behind him. An Aussie Adonis. And I suppose I have been in love with him ever since. For John Hargraves, there was theatre in life and death. His mate Chris Haywood, following director Paul Cox's instructions, to burn his eulogy. <laughs> Considered a master of his craft, it was not just John Hargrave's acting credits that were remembered today. The down deep in the heart, that place where deep, deep love lives, down there there's a place for you. Melbourne's cultural landmark is back, now 46 metres higher. The top sections were carefully lowered into place by a helicopter today. The new spire is similar in shape to the old one, which was to represent the flowing folds of a ballerina's tutu. The old spire was removed four months ago because of cracking in its structure. This one has been independently proof engineered. Another frustrating day for rescuers on the New South Wales north coast with a second bid to get six stranded, melon-headed whales back out to sea. Overnight, the mammals were shifted from a motel pool to a tidal creek north of Port Macquarie, ready for release. Dozens of volunteers helped whale rescue experts monitor the mammals' okay. health. After nearly 24 hours under care, the whales were put to sea. Only two made it to safety, the other four turned for the shore once again. Disappointed, the rescuers escorted them back in, only to see one die shortly after. Tonight, the vigil continues for those left, though little hope is now held for their survival. Dolphin researchers believe dolphin numbers in Port Phillip Bay may be increasing. As dolphins migrate to the southern end of the bay to breed, a small band of dedicated researchers are gathering to monitor them. These bottlenose dolphins wandering the waters of the southern part of the bay have brought back researchers for the third year running. And this time, Operation Dolphin Watch is calling on the public for help to monitor sightings around Port Phillip Bay. It will enable us to get a better handle on where the groups of dolphins are around the bay so that when we're planning our research, we can then start to go and into those areas where people are seeing the dolphins. During summer, these marine mammals form a maternal pod for mating, birthing and rearing their young. And today was the first time researchers saw some of those young ones bow waving. Whoa. Researchers fingerprint the dolphins' movements by photographing their unique dorsal fins. This year, four university students have scored paid employment with the Dolphin Watch program. I want to get work in my field, which is zoology. and 
this just a lot of the work around is volunteer work so this is just great being out on the bay every day working with these great animals and in my field operation dolphin watch runs for a week from this sunday the dolphin research project can be contacted on nine five three two one two five zero